Hi, we're back in our study in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And we're still talking about the annunciation or the announcement that the angel Gabriel made to Mary that she was going to have a baby and that his name would be called Jesus. And as we've been going through this, we've talked about the sovereignty of Jesus and the fact that he's a king and that he's in control. And I want us to finish up these couple of verses today by talking about the sinlessness of Jesus. Gabriel, the angel, said to Mary, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. He is described by Gabriel as the Holy One. Jesus, remember I mentioned this earlier in our study, was born of a woman. Mary was his mother. But because it was a virgin birth, it was an absolute unique birth. His father had no physical input into his birth. I've always found it interesting that the writer in the scripture that tells us about the virgin birth of Jesus was not one of the apostles who was a fisherman or a tax collector, but this was a medical doctor. So Jesus comes out of the womb of Mary, but yet he's different. There is, And here's what's so different about him, and this is important. There was not one sign of sin in this child that was born. Now understand that the Bible teaches that all of us are born with a Adamic nature. Now, I didn't just cuss, okay? He's born with an Adam-like nature, a nature like the first man God created, Adam. Adam and Eve, you remember, sinned, and as a result, were separated from God. We are born with that Adam-like or Adamic nature, which means we're all selfish. We're born sinful, and we're born separated from God, all of us. You've noticed, and we talk about this a lot, you don't have to teach children to do wrong. We birth children into a sinful world, and we birth sinful children. The great King David said, I was conceived in sin in my mother's womb. We are all born with a nature that has been away from God. We have a predisposition to do wrong, and we're predisposed to avoid doing right. That's why we need a Savior, and that's why we have to be, quote-unquote, saved. You see, sin is not just something we do. Sin is something we are. I am a sinner. And that's why that old me that has that sinful nature has to die, and I have to be spiritually reborn. I have to get a new nature. When Jesus was born, he was born of a woman, but not born of a man. So he was born with a sinless nature. And the amazing thing is, Jesus kept this sinlessness all throughout his life. And uh, you remember Adam. God made Adam and Eve, and he put them in a perfect environment. And God made them in his own image. They were made without sin. They were put into a sinless garden. They were put into a perfect environment, but yet they chose to sin. They lost their innocence. So you see, sin is not just a matter of our environment. It's a matter of who we are. The image of God, we were made in the image of God. It was destroyed or marred, and we became separated from God. The Bible says, Whereas sin came into the world through one man, that was Adam, it was passed to all of us. And then each of us, by our own choice, chose to sin. I don't think any of us would deny that we've not sinned at least once. You don't have to lie once to be a liar. You don't have to steal once to be a thief. You don't have to commit murder once to be a murderer. You don't have to sin once to be a sinner. So the first Adam, placed in a perfect environment, failed. Now Jesus is what the Bible calls the second Adam. He was born into a sinful world, yet he remained sinless until the day that he died. What the first Adam failed to do, the second Adam, Jesus, accomplished. So when Jesus died, he died 
sinless. Now, this is some basic Christian doctrine. Let me tell you, though, why this is so important. It's important for two reasons. One, this gives us an example to follow. You and I can look at Jesus. We can copy Jesus and never have to worry that we're doing the wrong thing. We still are amazed when we discover the flaws in our heroes. Um, I remember in history earlier in my life when people discovered that John F. Kennedy, who most considered to be a great president, was in essence a woman chaser. Some found it difficult to believe that President Roosevelt even struggled. Our nation struggled for such a long time after the fall of Richard Nixon. We still look in the papers, and now we have the Internet, and YouTube, and Facebook, and all of that, and we're astonished to learn all of the fatal flaws and characteristics of our heroes. And uh, it seems that the end justifies the means in any lifestyle people will choose. And it's hard to have heroes today because we know so much about them and their flaws. But here's something I want to tell you about Jesus, okay? The more you get to know Jesus, the more you'll discover to love about him because he's sinless. You'll never discover flaws in his life. You can look at Jesus and never be disappointed. Now, you can look at preachers, a pastor or teacher or a parent or a friend or a colleague or a neighbor or a spouse. They'll have flaws. Pastors can let you down. I've been a pastor and let people down. I've been let down by others. But when you put your eyes on Jesus, you have a perfect example that will never let you down and never discourage you because he's perfect and sinless. We can literally walk in his steps. So it's important that Jesus is sinless because we have a sinless example. But it also is important because we need, let me give you a big word, an expiation or a sacrifice. We need a sacrifice for our sins and our sinful nature. Jesus is qualified to redeem us or to buy us back or to fix us because he is sinless. In the Old Testament, the lamb that was given as a sacrifice for sin would be one that was uh, without blemish. He would be spotless. A flawed lamb was not qualified to be a sacrifice. So in the same way, a sinful person could not be our substitute. When the Bible says that Jesus was on the cross and that God was in Jesus, reconciling or bringing the world back to himself he could do that because Jesus was sinless and he became sin for us on the cross. What's this? The son of God became a son of man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. Jesus was the spotless, pure, sinless lamb of God. He died on the cross as the substitute for our sins. The Bible said, cursed is he who hangs on the tree. When the spotless, sinless Lamb of God was crucified, he became every sin you and I have ever told. He became every lustful thought you and I have ever had. He became every disobedient act we've ever committed. He became the sin we committed. So the salvation that he provides for us is so great. That is why we love him so much. He is the perfect sinless sacrifice for our sins and shortcoming. I said at the beginning of this study that we preach about a lot of things, how to live, principles, and, but we don't preach enough just about Jesus. I think somehow some of us think that's just not practical enough, but you can't get more practical than the death of Jesus and his sacrifice. You see, I don't spend eternity separated from God because I drink something I shouldn't drink or because I have a sexual act that I shouldn't have or that I commit some crime like murder or thief uh, or stealing. 
I spend eternity separate from God because I reject the sinless, perfect Son of God who became the sacrifice for my sins and shortcomings. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. He is the only provision for our shortcoming, which is sin. I can be consistent in attendance at worship. I can be a religious person. I can be a good moral person. But the issue is not that. I am a sinner by nature and by choice. I must be forgiven. My sin must be atoned for. The only person who can do that is the perfect, sinless, spotless Lamb of God who becomes my substitute. The central issue is Jesus. We need to, I love this, we need to come to issue with the issue that the issue is Jesus. Did you get all of that? It doesn't matter how much we're in church if we've not invited Jesus into our hearts as our Savior and to use the word I used in an earlier study, our Sovereign or our Lord. Without Him, we face eternity alone. Again, the issue is not morality or ethics. The issue is Jesus. If you have never trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, it doesn't matter what else you've done. You need Jesus. This message is important and practical. It's also practical for this reason. As a believer in Jesus, as one in whom Jesus lives in our hearts, the issue is not lying, cheating, stealing, murder, or adultery. That's not the issue. Those things are wrong, but that's not the issue. The issue is, who is in charge of my life? Who is in charge of your life? We get all hung up on these things that we do that we think are right or wrong. The issue is control. Who is controlling your life? Who is sovereign in your life? Is it Jesus? When I lie or cheat, etc., I'm saying I'm in control, not you. I sit on the throne of my life, not you. As we finish up these verses, it is important for us to remember that Jesus is the sinless, spotless Son of God who wants to control our lives and be our Lord. We'll go to the next section of Scripture in our next study.